Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for turning out in such impressive numbers. Let me start with a small apology. I'm sorry that we've been keeping you waiting. Uh, the delegation has just been with the Honourable Chief Minister. We had a very good discussion with her, which went on uh, for a little longer than we expected. And then just to give them the full uh, authentic Kolkata experience, we've just been sitting in traffic. Uh, for minutes. So now the delegation understand what it is to, uh, to live and to, to, to exist in this, in this great city. Uh, you, none of you came here this evening to hear me speak. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Scott Burstonwood. I'm the British Deputy High Commissioner uh, here in Kolkata. I just wanted to say a very few words to welcome you, to thank you for being here with us this evening, and to say how delighted I am and my team is to be co-hosting this discussion this evening with our, our partners at the Anatta Aspen Centre uh, for this discussion on uh, the theme of striving for gender equality in politics. Uh, we're very lucky to have with us in Kolkata this week a delegation of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association of the UK Parliament, members of both the House of Lords and the House of Commons, led by the Lord Speaker, the Right Honourable uh, Baroness D'Souza. Uh, she is one of our panellists this evening, and joining her on the panel is um, a lady who I'm sure you all know, Michael Moitra, who's the General Secretary of the All India Trinamool Congress, and Professor Samita Sen, who is going to moderate this discussion this evening. Uh, we'll hear from uh, our contributors here, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to ask as many questions as you'd like. I hope we can get a discussion going. There's a huge crowd here in this room. It's really exciting to see that. So please enjoy the evening. Thank you again for being here. I'll hand over to you the panel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me once again on my behalf welcome you all to this evening's uh, program. Uh, you may wonder um, that the Baroness D'Souza went to meet the Honorable CM. Um, we have in front row of this uh, program several, many, uh, women politicians. We have a room full of people coming to listen to this program. Are we talking about striving for gender equality in politics or are we talking about striven for gender <laughs> equality in politics? Um, let us hear uh, the panelists speak on this from very different uh, perspectives. Uh, so I will I request the panelists to speak for about 10 minutes uh, and then we can have a discussion. Uh, so will, the, uh, will Baroness D'Souza speak first? Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really absolutely delighted to be here. And I might add, I'm very well. Not working, overwhelmed. Well, to see so many of you here, I really, to be quite honest, um, we had some meticulous planning uh, for this, this delegation, and I think that uh, the planning for this particular event was one line Bengal club panel discussion. Um, so I'm a little bit unprepared in the sense that I haven't prepared anything at all. Um, so I think what I shall do uh, is just sort of witter on for a little bit about sort of women women in politics, but women in general, um, and perhaps give you some background to the struggle that has gone on, which many of you know about very well indeed, in the UK, starting perhaps, well, let's start at, say, the suffragettes uh, in the earlier part of the last century, and I might add, going on still today, not in terms of votes for women, but other positions for women. I think what I want to do is to also say um, many things which you already know, but it's sometimes quite useful to say things that you already know because you all feel, well, you know, you're totally well ed educated and, 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 and literate. But I, the other thing I do want to, to emphasize is that many of the issues about uh, empowerment of women um, is something that, uh, it's not something that you deal with in, in, in India or a particular state of India. It is something that we continue to deal with in the UK. I mean, you know, just to give you one example of that, that the percentage of women in the House of Lords, which is an appointed house, not an elected, am I popping? I am popping a bit, aren't I? Um, which is in the appointed house, not an elected house, 
uh, the percentage of women is 24. And it's the highest it's ever been. When I first entered the house 10 years ago, uh, just over 10 years ago, it was 17%. So it's slowly, gradually, inexorably creeping up. But one would have expected that we would have reached at least the UN target by now. Uh, but we haven't, and I can't really speak for the House of Commons, though many of my colleagues sitting on the front row here most probably could, and maybe they will when it comes to interactions, but I think that the number of women in, in the Commons at the moment is, is, is probably round about the same, same level. So why, why, uh, why do we focus on women? Why should women be empowered? What is it about really? First thing that you already know very well indeed, if you educate girls, wherever you are, from, I like, I was going to say Libya, but Liberia, but that's not, from Tunisia to, to Timbuktu, which is not terribly far, but if you then go to say Tasmania, <laughs> wherever you go, if you educate girls, what you get is development. I mean, it's this magical, magical bullet, and we've all known that for a long time. And what do we mean by developed? We mean uh, later marriages, uh, better family spacing, uh, commitment by women uh, to see that their daughters are educated, um, a commitment to some kind of a career, and indeed to, to, to as someone said to me earlier today, um, you know, you educate a, a, a girl, uh, you educate a, 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 a potential family and indeed even a potential community. So that's I mean, if there were no other reason in the world, that's a good reason why one should empower uh, women. Economically, um, there is evidence, growing evidence, to show that if you include women at the highest levels of decision-making on executive boards, that the profits of your company will increase. And I address here all those who are in the corporate sector, particularly the men that if you include women on your board, your profits will increase. <laughs> and this is something which I think has been in the study which has been carried out by Forbes in America quite recently, I mean, um, uh, uh, early, earlier last year, which shows that if you include three or four women on your board, um, again, it's magical. You know, you, you, you get an increase uh, in profits. Why that is, what is the sort of, you know, the essential logical connection between women and profit, I'm not sure, because I haven't actually read the book yet. But I do know that it's reliably reported that if you include women. We have had an inquiry which was set up in, under the previous administration in the House of Lords by one particular peer to look at the extent to which FTSE quoted companies are actually taking women on their boards. And it's been such a high profile issue that it is beginning to increase significantly now that women are going onto the boards of FTSE companies. Of course, all this means it's not a question of sort of just picking up um, any woman and sort of saying, well, you know, you better come on our board because you're a woman, but actually finding women who have the, the, the right kind of background, the right kind of expertise. And that goes way back to issues such as affordable childcare and proper maternity leave and all those sorts of things, which again, uh, we have to discuss. We know that in the Nordic countries that uh, women are much better represented in their, in their parliaments, uh, but they also have extremely reliable childcare. It is a matter of uh, common, common use that you have a child, you have a year's maternity leave, there's a nursery down the end of your street. It's, 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 it, you know, they're standardized, they're extremely well run, they're affordable. You know, women can get back into the workforce because the government ensures that they do have adequate childcare. Politically, why are women uh, important in politics? Well, the political conversation, you must admit, all of you, is simply incomplete. If politics is a representation of people, ideally, uh, it should be, then obviously you have got to have women, you know, not just to fight for women's issues, not just women to sort of do, you know, schooling and education and primary health care and uh, things like that, but, you know, you need women because they are half of the population. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a logic uh, that there is, there's no denying that logic. Now, as I said before, that um, the struggle in the UK uh, has been obviously long uh, and arduous and vicious and violent and ultimately, you know, rather successful. 
um, the suffragettes, uh, we're about to, well, we're gearing up to celebrating 100 years of votes for women, which was achieved in 1918. Um, and so, therefore, 2018 is 100 years of votes for women. And to that end, you know, there are a number of events which show what women actually did, what they suffered, what they, what they were imprisoned, they were forcibly fed, they were treated incredibly badly uh, in order to achieve the vote. Um, the right of women to be represented in the House of Lords, um, of which I am currently the, the Speaker of the House of Lords, was equally um, arduous, and so much so that even women visitors to the House of Lords, many of you would have visited the House of Lords, but there's a gallery around it, you know, quite, quite a high gallery uh, with bars, and um, before they allowed women visitors to come and visit the House of Lords, they had to put in a little curtain, because otherwise you might have seen their petticoats. And this was something that, you know, the, 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 the House of Lords was really very concerned about. So we still have that sort of retention of the sort of, I think men's fear of women more than anything else. Um, so, uh, <laughs> women, and then what we had was the, the Life Peerages Act in 1958. The Life Peerages Act is exactly what, it means what it says, which is appointing peers who are not uh, aristocrats, who don't come from hereditary families, to the House of Lords. And of course, it wasn't, uh, it couldn't, even at that time, be sexist. So that was the time when women started coming into the House of Lords as appointees. Um, and that is sort of very slow. It's taken an awful long time, we must admit, 50 years or more. Awful long time for that to achieve what we have now, which is 24%. In 1968, we had the representation of people, not the representation of the People's Act. It was it was called something else, but basically what it was, was the, um, the, the freedom of hereditary peers to disown their titles uh, in order that they might become members of the House of Commons. And the first person to do that was some who you may be familiar with, a uh, man you may be familiar with who died last year, Tony Benn, who was uh, a, a Viscount. Uh, prior to um, letting go, as it were, of his hereditary peerage, um, and then became an MP for almost in his entire life. He retired um, a couple of years, I think, before he actually actually died. So um, that too allowed um, hereditary women peers to enter the house. It was sort of you know, an all-in-one act, as it were. So you know, in terms of the history of Parliament and the history of the House of Lords, it's been an incredibly speedy avalanche of women into the House of Lords, which over the last hundred years has crept up and crept up and crept up. I think that the kind of issues that we might possibly take up in discussion, because I'm aware that um, I'm probably reaching the limit of my time, um, are things such as how you promote political empowerment of women. Let me just say one very short thing. I am here as a member of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association delegation, as indeed are my colleagues. And the CPA has, over the past three years, been extremely interested in this whole question of political empowerment of women. And to that end, and I've been fortunate enough to be involved in this over the past three years, we are trying to uh, in, enhance and strengthen a network of women parliamentarians, initially across South Asia, uh, and then we hope to be able to link it up because I was late last year traveling in, in Taiwan and in Japan uh, to see whether we could try and uh, engender that sort of motivation and feeling uh, in a country like Japan which has 3% of women in its parliament for all kinds of compl complicated cultural reasons which we may go into. But the network of women parliamentarians um, is, is growing in South Asia. Um, it was great shame that this, in, in May of last year, we held a workshop, the CPA held a workshop, um, in which it invited women from five different countries, including uh, Afghanistan and, and Bangladesh and um, Pakistan and Nepal and Sri Lanka and all these, I think, as well, um, in order to take part in workshops to find out what kind, what, what worked and what didn't work. Because we know that in some parliaments, that women parliamentarians who form a caucus of women's parliamentarians can do amazing work in terms of uh, building up and, and, and having enacted 
legislation which is extremely friendly to women and striking down existing legislation which is inimical to, to, to women. And at the same time working with the NGO community in order to empower women at the local level and through uh, regional, through provincial and then local governments as well. It can work. Uh, and, uh, the, the, you know, again, the sort of microfinance schemes that have been run in many of these countries have been extraordinarily important in not only, you know, empowering women financially somewhat and a degree of independence, but also uh, thereby um, allowing them to think that they can enter into the political world. I know that it is one of the key features of your relatively new Prime Minister, which is what we're all very interested in as the, the programme, the agenda for the next few years. I know that uh, your Prime Minister, Mr Modi, is extremely interested in empowering women for very, very good reasons. So all I will say at this stage before we enter into a dialogue, uh, which I hope it will be, is good for Mr Modi, um, wonderful. Uh, I, um, we're, 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 we're all extremely supportive and it, it, it probably will show very tangible results in a short time, but I'm very interested to hear more about what you think, what you and indeed the, my fellow panelists think about the opportunities and constraints of political empowerment of women. Thank you so much. And uh, welcome, very warm welcome. You can see a lot of you are tired and jet lagged, and I hope we can have a cup of tea after this. Uh, um, for someone who wasn't prepared, I think that was brilliant. But I think when you're a living example of something that we're talking about, you don't actually need to prepare. You come in here and you breathe it, right? You're breathing it, you're walking it, and that's what's important. And that came across very well. Uh, we're here to talk about gender equality in politics. Now, where does that start? A hundred years ago, it was about the women's right to vote. That was all it was about. And then it became a seat at the political table. And today, what is it really? It is about moving away from being just a political demographic. We tend to look at women as the women's vote. Women as a voting block. When you look at men, you don't think of men are voters, right? You don't think of men as voters. You think of uh, businessmen, let's try and get the business vote, let's try and get the trade vote, let's go and get the cultural vote. We, we don't divide, we divide men up across economic lines, across social lines. Whereas when you think of women, you think of women as, this is the women's vote, women for Obama, women for Labour, women for Mamta Banerjee. We need to move across from that. Women need to be defined across the same lines as we define men, across trade, across economic sections, across social strata. Women are not a voting block. So we need to move away from this master status. Gender is a master status, which is that you're looking at, I mean, for us, being a woman is our primary sort of defining social characteristic. And whether we are politicians, whether we are women voters, anything to do with women in politics, it's our identity as women is our defining identity. To move forward, that is what we need now. We've got the right of the vote, we've got a seat at the political table. We need to vote, we need to move away from being just a block. That's what's most important. Um, she brought a, uh, she brought the perspective from the UK, and it would be unfair if I didn't talk about India. I, I was you know I was born in India and uh, studied to class 12 in India and then went to the US and went to an all-women school in the US, Mount Holyoke, which was one of the Seven Sisters all-women schools, I'm proud of it. And then went to work as a trader in an investment bank in New York, and then in London, and finished there and entered politics. So I think I've really been, uh, I was in a bubble for the first 18 years of my life, and then went bang, bang, right? Literally out of the bubble onto the trading floor, and then into politics. So I think one of the things that we need to talk about uh, when we talk about women in politics is that when we got the right of the vote in the US, it was in 1920, they got the right of the vote. It, independence and the right of the vote were completely different. In the UK, you got the right of the vote in 1918. In India, you would think India was sort of less developed, sort of, you know, economically everywhere, it was a colonial, it was a colony. But think about this, when India got independence in 1947, our, const our founders of our constitution thought long and hard whether democracy was the right way. Whether people with low levels of literacy could handle democracy. So whether you could give the right of the vote to everybody was a question in their minds. 
But not once did they ever think that should we give the right of the vote to men and not to women. Do you see what I'm saying? So in other countries, in, in Asia, other countries in far more developed nations, in the UK, in the US, there was a gap between independence and the right to vote. In India, which is considered a traditional society, the right to vote came automatically with independence. Our founding fathers never thought that women would be different. So in that way, India is a strange paradox. It is a strange paradox. In some ways, we're far behind in many ways, you know, when it comes to gender equality. But in some ways, especially in politics, and this is something that hits me every day. When we look into the villages and you see the level of women participation, we have something which is called Pachayati Raj, which says your elected representatives at the village and block level have to be between 33 and 50 percent. So all over India today, you have Panchayat level leaders, you have village level leaders who have about 50 percent representation. We brought in the numbers, we brought in a law, we did it. But let's look at Parliament. In the House of Lords, in the sort of our Rajya Sabha, which is our upper house, equivalent to your House of Lords, the percentage of women is 12.8%, which is almost half that of 24% in the UK. In the Lok Sabha, it's an abysmal 11%. It's 11%. What is the worldwide average? 22%. What is the Nordic average? 42%. What's it in the UK? 22.7%. What's it in the US? 25%. What's it in the rest of Asia? 19%. Arab countries, 18%. India has got 33, between 33 and 50% at a base level. Yet in parliament, it's got 11%. So what's the difference? How do you solve this puzzle? This is something I really think long and hard about. And I don't know if this is the right answer, but it's something I think is a step towards the right answer. I think it's something all of us should think about. I think when you look at the base level, we look at women as Women are very integrated. When women are very integrated, they are, I think our economic status at a lower level, at the village level, is the greatest leveler. So women share equally in sort of tilling the field, in housework, in everything. You live in joint families where you've got access to childcare, where people look after your children. And there really is, like, you know, you had in uh, uh, sort of, I think among the very rich and the very poor, the standard middle class cultural perspectives do not apply. And that's something which is the world over, right? I think it is in middle class societies where people think about women can't go out and do this, women can't go out, I don't want my daughter doing this. Whereas I think among the very poor, when it's about putting bread and butter on the table and filling your stomach, people are not thinking about, oh, shall I send my daughter five miles out to sell tea on the street at a bus stop and earn money? They don't think about it because they realize if they don't do that, they will starve. So you see, at, so in the village level, these sort of cultural, the cultural barriers are almost less. So you have that kind of 50% 50 of 50 the villages, but when you go up the sort of social strata in India, and our, you know, we're still a very classist and a very sort of socially divisive society, what happens is your moral, your cultural, your traditional values step in, and that is, what, that is where women face problems to getting into politics. When we look at parliamentarians in, the, in, the, in India, what you, what is not, one other thing that strikes me is it's almost like in the UK you have hereditary peers. In India, Indian parliament seems to be almost an elected house of hereditary people. I mean, your father's an MP, your mother's an MP, you've inherited a constituency. When I entered politics in India, you know what people told me? I was an investment banker. When I was coming in, I said, I'm going to do it. And all my well-wishers said one thing to me that has stayed with me. They said, Mahua, if you don't have a father who's an MP and you don't have 3,000 crores, you're not going to make it in Indian politics. That was the truth. It sounded harsh, but that's what people told me. And that is the myth I set out to shatter. I said, I am going to do it. I don't care if it takes me five years. I don't care if it takes me 20 years. But I want to be in a non-left party. And by a left party, I mean a, not a cattle-based party. I mean a mass-based political party. And I want to show people that you can come in, you can make a lateral entry, you can work hard, and you can gain acceptance. So that's the path I'm walking. And I think that is the path that sort of more middle-class and upper-middle-class educated women in India need to walk. And that is the only way we're going to get more representation in parliament and into policy making. Because still we have boxes where women deal with only women's issues, where women deal with only child care, parental issues, domestic violence, and men deal with trade, with finance, with constitutional reform. We're always going to have silos. So we need to have women participation, enough women, numbers do matter, critical mass matters. We have that in, and then you will have a gender perspective across policy making. You don't have to have separate boxes. So that's what we need to strive 
towards. And you know, that's where I would like this discussion to go. And I'm going to end by saying one thing which they taught me in college. If you love a lady politician, raise your hand. If not, raise your standards. <laughs> Um, so we have heard uh, the two perspectives and I think we've got a great deal to think about in those two presentations. Um, and in a sense I think there is also a generational reflection in, in what we heard. The question of gender equality in mainstream political institutions has not been on the table for a long time. It's about 20 years uh, since we've been talking about these issues. Before that, it was merely the right of political representation, i.e. the vote. The question of women's, uh, of, of uh, equality for women in politics has been fought in these, this, this paradoxical question which both our speakers has in one way or the other referred to which is whether having women in politics is good for women or is it good for society. And underlying this paradox is a question that nobody actually verbalizes, which is, is it bad for men? <laughs> um, and it is some, all our arguments tend to revolve, I think, around these uh, um, uh, this kind of paradoxical question and this is not a contradiction what is good for women and what is good for society need not be a contradiction but it is often perceived um, as such and one of the, the issues that are caught up with that question is the question of who represents who can only if if we if we argue that uh, women in politics is important for the good of women in society, then at some level we are arguing also that only women can truly or will represent women. In India that question has been extremely fraught, uh, as Mohua has already indicated. Uh, women in India is not a unitary constituency by any means, politically or otherwise. In Britain, the question has been fraught with race, with class tensions at one point in Britain's history, with race questions at a latter point in Britain's history. In India, the two issues that have been absolutely, you know, powder kegs are uh, caste and community. <laughs> As you know, the, the, the uh, Panchayati Raj example Mahua gave you is the result of an extremely um, um, forward thinking, one would say, uh, but uh, mm -hmm. rather uh, um, uh, uh, one-off kind of political will uh, in, uh, through an act, uh, 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 amendment to the constitution undertaken by the Rajiv Gandhi government in 1994, by which actually seats for women in local uh, uh, panchayats and municipalities are reserved for women, women to the tune of one third uh, or half. This, this one-off measure was then, it was attempted to follow this up by reserving seats for women also in state assemblies, the parliament. That, the opposition to that, those, that question, which led to scenes of extreme violence within both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, marshals had to be called in, People were, you know, men were uh, lying on the floor in opposition to this. It was a piece of very, you know, uh, remarkable theatre in one way. Now, the, 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 it is the opposition to the bill that draws our attention to the question anew. Why is it that at this, the level of the assembly and the parliament, the very entry of women uh, is considered so uh, uh, negative and of course it tells you that across the board in assemblies and uh, uh, the Lok Sabha in India's history of independence 
women have never been more than 10 to 12 percent uh, of these bodies. Uh, so we have a complex of questions there to address. I'm sure the the um, um, audience is uh, very keen to ask questions of the panelists. I'll open the floor for about 10 minutes. Uh, so we'd, I'd like to request uh, all those asking questions to be as brief uh, as possible. Please mention your own name and uh, who your question is directed to. Um, and uh, I, I, I'll open the floor now. Please. Is there a mic? Yeah. Yes. Hello. Yes. Hi. I'm Dame Angela Watkinson, and I'm a Conservative <laughs> Member of Parliament in the UK House of Commons. Now, the delegation visited a wonderful school this morning, and I was speaking to some girls aged six, seven, eight, nine, and asking them what did they want to do when they grew up. They were very bright, intelligent girls, full of aspiration and ambition. And they wanted to be engineers, scientists, mathematicians, doctors, but not one of them said they wanted to be a politician. <laughs> um, I know that UK politicians visit their schools all the time, and I wonder if Indian MPs do the same thing, especially with uh, um, senior pupils and colleges, to tell them about your career in politics, to try and encourage them to consider it as a career. I think that's a very uh, pertinent question and uh, that's one thing my mother in the audience will tell you. When I was 10 years old and you asked me what I wanted to be, I'd say I wanted to be Indira Gandhi. So, uh, <laughs> who was then Prime Minister. But yes, that is something, that's unfortunately, that's, some, that's one of the examples I give when I often go to talk to people is that we don't teach our daughters, we teach our children to be doctors, to be engineers, we don't teach our children to be politicians. It's almost as if politicians in India are a dirty word. This is the truth. Well, when I came back and I left banking and I entered politics, my mother and father reacted like there was a death in the family. You know, that's the fact. They couldn't get over it because that's the problem. The politics in India traditionally, I think from between the time of independence to now, these sort of 60 years, we've seen such a, sort of the perception of politics and politicians in this country unfortunately has been declining so rapidly that people think for women it's unsafe. They think you've got to be corrupt to survive in politics. The idea of doing good via politics is almost... Um, Impossible. People think if you've got to do good, you go work for the non-governmental organization. You go open a school, you open a charity, you don't enter politics. So I think that's the biggest hurdle that we've got to overcome. And for that, for every parent sitting in this room, for every grandparent sitting in this room, we need your help. Till you teach your daughters to go out there and say, this is something we can change the world with, it's not going to happen. So it's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> Okay, so this is a question to both the panelists. I think both of you spoke wonderfully, and it's actually enlightened, uh, you know, the entire audience here. Uh, if you see a women's designation as far as politics is concerned, generally women are given very soft, uh, you know, they're given a soft ministerial birth, like probably health or um, uh, minority issues or something like that. The only thing is time that uh, women get. Um, you know, uh, uh, stronger roles in politics rather than just taking care of education or taking care of minority issues or it could be health. Do you think it's time? So much. I guess you're, you're not saying that health is unimportant. <laughs> it's not unimportant. I, I meant, uh, for, for example, I'm exactly. I'm sure, absolutely. Um, let me give you let me give you a little story, okay? Uh, from the UK, <coughs> there was there was in the House of Lords a particular peer who is also a crime writer. Her name is Ruth Rendell, and Ruth Rendell has been a Labour peer for many 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 years. And she had one issue that she started talking about ten years ago in the House of Lords, which is female genital mutilation, okay? And she was stood up at every possible opportunity and everyone knew when Ruth stood up that she was going to talk about female genital mutilation and that she'll be outlawed, particularly in the UK, and there should be you no know, prosecutions, etc. 
There was a debate in the House of Lords um, last year on the female genital mutilation and the fact that there have been many prosecutions in the UK despite the fact that it takes place. And of, I think, the ten speakers, nine were men. Uh, and some of them, I might say, somewhat aged men, um, because a lot of them are very aged, white males, uh, in, 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 you know, sort of crusty, some of them hereditary peers even. I mean, you really can't imagine a more sort of conservative sort of, you know, conglomeration of characteristics who stood up and said how disgraceful it was. So that's one story to show you that I think you know, it may well be that women have a particular interest and they feel able to bring up uncomfortable subjects in public arenas, okay? Because they care about them and because there is a sisterhood. The fact is that by bringing up uncomfortable issues which men have either not thought of, possibly, probably, or indeed don't wish to bring up, uh, becomes an issue that is not discussed and debated. So, on your, but on your other point, and that's another little sort of story, that of the six leaders uh, in the House of Lords in, in the last sort of, again, 10 years, leaders of the opposition, leaders of the government, uh, Lord Speaker's chief whips, um, of the six, I think five have been women, okay? So, uh, things are changing, and when I say um, leaders, I mean, these are not easy jobs, these are jobs which require a lot of political wheeling and dealing, um, a lot of compromise, a lot of hard bargaining. Uh, it may not be sort of Einsteinian, you know, physics, but it's quite hard jobs and it's, it's not sort of the soft option at all. So I think, I think it is changing. And additionally, that we do have in the House of Lords, we have philosophers, women philosophers, women financial analysts, um, obviously uh, uh, medics and scientists. Uh, we have people, women who are concerned about the built environment and architecture. So again, it's, it's, it's kind of changing. Um, and it's a question of promoting role models by these sort of events, by talking in schools, which we have an enormous outreach um, department in the House of Lords and the House of Commons, where we do go and talk to schools and to colleges and to, to everyone else. Simply to say, you two could be politicians. Can I say just one word about the last question? encourage your daughters to be politicians. But you know what? I think that politicians actually need to have a life before they actually get into in politics. Not that politics isn't a life. You know, there are people uh, who join a club, a, a political party club at school, they go to university and they join sort of young conservatives or young labor, whatever they might be. They go to university, they do the same thing. They go to work as a researcher or an intern for an MP of a particular party in Parliament or they work in a think tank which is either right or left <coughs> and then they, they seek to become an MP. They've never done anything but politics and actually I think you do need people who have something to offer other than politics, you know, who've been out there, who've run things, who know what it's like at the front level. I, I could witter on, I'm not going to go through <laughs> Um, I, I just, I get the feeling that we're putting the cart before the horse. If we say that, yes, when you see women who are educated, good things happen. It has an effect on the family. That's evidence-based. But if we say that women should be in politics because it's a good thing, then I think we're expressing warm feelings, which essentially has to deal with cold reality. We don't have any evidence. In fact, in our country, the evidence is... A Bit to the contrary, that women being thrust into politics is a good thing. It's not. And it seems that what would be a nice thing to happen is for women to get educated, for women to participate in public and social life, and then come into politics. I think that would be a nice way of putting the horse before the cart, rather than just say, oh, it's a nice thing. Let's. As far as the evidence on women and profits, my rather simple-minded submission is that it's the companies that make the profits who have the wisdom and who can afford the risk-taking to say, let's diversify our <laughs> So it's really correlation, but not causation. I don't know why women want reservation. After all, they are coming up, 11% have come on their own merit. If we have reservation, undeserving people will also get to. 
Look at that as a The women in Rajya Sabha are very ineffective. I think women, women who have success, like Indira Gandhi and many others, have come up. The reservation only gives the, a position where even people who may not be competent can come up. I think the reservation, women are asking for equality, and I think it's time they come to the parliament or the assemblies or anywhere on merit alone and not reservation. And that will be a real, real strength of women. Hello? Yes. May I ask you, as, as I was listening to you and the number of peers in the notes, uh, my mind went to my own experience. In 1996, we had a general election in our country and all the political parties, big, small, medium, they all promised that they will give 33% of representation in parliament as well as the state assemblies. I remember I asked a question during zero hour and it was a very simple question that since all the parties are agreed on it, why don't we have the, we have to pass a bill, a constitution amendment bill, why don't you have the bill, we can discuss and pass it. I remember I was congratulated by everybody for asking that question and they all said that it will be passed in this session, 1996, the month of May. Today is 2015, the bill is still hanging fire, nothing has been done. Now, we, we knew that it would be difficult to pass the bill in that order. We did try different means and one means that I, I myself tried very best and even the then election commissioner agreed with me on that was and that is the question I would like to ask you. I thought that instead of having the presentation in, in, the assembly, in the parliament or in the assembly, wouldn't it be better to have a reservation within the party? That is when you are selecting your candidates, you should say the parties that we should have 30% or 40% of women in, uh, among our candidates. In that case, we can send many more women there instead of going there. For us in India, it will be very difficult, very, very easy because we don't have to have go to a constitution amendment bill. We have something called Representation of People's Act. We just have to introduce one line saying that all political parties should send, say, 30%, 40% women candidates, where they select the candidates. If they don't, they can't participate in the election. That's all. And it doesn't need a constitution amendment bill. But somehow we could not do it. Now from your experience, we have followed our parliamentary system from your country. From your experience, don't you think that this would be a better thing if we have this from the parties rather than treat women as a species in parliament, women fighting against women if there is reservation there. As if, you know, it is much better than honorable way to fight equally and count. So what about this? Why don't you think about that? That all the political parties, when selecting candidates, should select a certain percentage of women. Um, I, my dear colleague has suggested I answer your question um, first because I do it quite briefly. I think all women lists uh, by law, by legislation or by ordinance or whatever it might be. Yes, why not? But, but, I think one has to be quite thoughtful about, uh, I mean you're treating women as a species, well, apart from anything else as separate species by doing that, but I think one has to be quite careful. Um, I wonder if anyone here in the room knows which country has the most women parliamentarians. Rwanda. Rwanda. Who's in Rwanda? Rwanda is right. Rwanda is right. Rwanda, Rwanda has something like, um, well, they say now it's 56, but uh, 50, 50 ish. Um, and that is a result of all women party lists, uh, which Paul Kagame, the president, when he came in after the terrible events of 1994, determined, you know, turned Rwanda around all the rest of it. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But in a way, what you're doing is actually designating a certain percentage of seats for women, regardless of whether there are women 
who are the right sort of people to fill it. And I do think that you run the danger of not any this sort of bias towards women, which is not really, you know, it's the opposite of natural selection. But I have to say that I think it might well result, it could result, in having women enter politics by virtue of the fact that they are women rather than they are qualified for the job. And you may get less good politics in terms of actually contributing to the political debate. It may well be that you should, one should do that for a short time. As, I mean, there, we've got Labour representatives here from, I mean, Labour did have all women uh, party lists, and I think they abandoned them because uh, I believe you know, it wasn't possible to fulfill them, or you were not necessarily filling them with the right people. Okay. I'll answer, there were two questions there. There was one there which said that, you know, is the right thing um, that women are thrust into politics. Um, I think that's, uh, frankly, I wouldn't quite use the word thrust into politics. I think short of the very select situations where you have a death of an elected member or something like that, and political parties deem it best that to give it to, that's something that is a traditional a hierarchical way of thinking in India, which we've, we've got a lot out of, which will take us a few years to get out of. I think the question of women being thrust into politics is not really a fair one, because apart from select situations where, you've, where there's been a death and you come in to fill that seat of being the wife or a daughter, I don't think women are thrust into politics. As to the right way into politics, I completely agree with her when she says that you need to, to use sort of, you know, very colloquial term here, you need to have a life. It's very important. You need to have a life. I had a life before I entered politics and my life was in banking. Somebody else's could be as a doctor. Somebody else's could be as an engineer. Somebody else's could be in anything. So I don't think there's any particular path. You don't have to be sort of a social activist or go into things. It's like, you know, I had friends in banking who had majored in accounting and finance, had interned with investment banks, and they came out to trading floors, and they could only do a certain thing. They couldn't think beyond the box. They couldn't think. Whereas we went in and got PP&E majors from Oxford, and we got bio majors from Cambridge, and we had liberal arts majors in the United States, and they made much better traders and much better bankers because they could think outside the box. And I think that applies everywhere. So I think politics is, the idea is politics is a way to change society, to change the world, to change our country. And that is the mindset with which people from all walks of life should enter politics. I think that's what's important. You know, it's not sort of uh, being thrust in or anything like that. To the gentleman at the back who answered, who said that, is it, is it important that we get people in just due to reservation and not a merit? I think you answered that uh, already is one thing I do need to bring in because uh, even I when I entered Indian politics and I, I know I could be wrong in this and this is something we need to think about when I entered I always believed that politics like everything else should be a meritocracy nothing should be given in because you run the danger of sort of filling it with people who might not be suitable for the job but having said that where do you start for example it's the same thing as black empowerment affirmative action when you're dealing with disparity that is so huge where do you start? Do you start with bringing in reservation for a few years and then slowly weeding it off? And I've seen in the villages, what happens is I'm going into a village meeting and you say, where is the, where is the village head? And it's a woman and it's a man following me all day. He's doing working with me. And I said, okay, can I get a signature for the village head? He said, oh, that's my wife. She's at home. I said, all right. So she's the elected representative and you know, you're in the car all day. What is happening? So it may not work, it may not work, but what it does work is the children of that mother and the children of that father grow up knowing that my mother is the Panchayat Pradhan, my mother is the village thing, no matter what. So in three generations, that child will grow up thinking of his mother as a, in a position of power. So I think over the years, as a whole, you know, reservation or representation as a means to just um, sort of balance the skew might be a good idea. And this is something that I'm still open to. It's not an answer I've arrived at, but that is, you know, another perspective. My name is Shabir Datta. And it was, a, it was an excellent time hearing all of you. I would like to place one, one point. And you can the the success of a democracy happens on the quality of politicians, not their sex. Whether it is man or it is woman, there, there, there was no at that time when Margaret Thatcher was prime minister, 
he she, she changed the history of economic history of Britain. And that happened because she went through all the way. She was a chemist, she was a uh, she was a barrister, then she came to politics. So by reserving that purpose own reserve. What we should do is to make our girls more welcome in the family. I'm saying something very knowledgeable. But there is a lot of female infant infanticide in this country. So they are unwelcome from that point. So we have to lift that up. Give them education, give them a proper health, nourishment, and, and also possibilities of career. Then only we can think of their joining politics. Good evening, ma'am. I finally have the microphone with me after quite a while. Um, I'm actually quite confused, you know. Uh, I've been to several seminars on women empowerment and, and so on and so forth. And now, suddenly we talk about gender equality and that way in politics. Uh, you know, and then we talk about reservations. I mean, what, what, what exactly is happening around, uh, you know, I, I'll come to my question in a moment. You know, the, the, the concept of fear uh, in men it seems to have, uh, you know, reached such alarming portions, proportions that, you know, we, we are just not uh, allowing things to happen the way they should be. Now, coming back to my question, uh, as far as the Indian society is concerned, uh, 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 Ms. Maitra, do, do you think over the past, let's say about a decade or so, there is, is you know, a, a conscious decision, a conscious uh, uh, effort is being made to uh, kind of give opportunities to people who don't come from a certain pedigree of politics uh, and, and try and make it a more of a mass kind of a, an opportunity. Thank you so much. Yes, I, I, think, I think that is correct. I think, um, I think that is correct. Again, I think I addressed this in my speech, is that when you're looking at people at the village level, that's not something we need to worry about. We've got that just because of the traditional values. But if you're thinking of middle and upper class within India, educated people, then there has been a greater um, attempt, I think, to get representation from non-hereditary people. There has been. Uh, but on the other side, I, I look at the data on that. That's also great. But when you look at the number percentage of parliamentarians who are hereditary, it's never been higher than now. So, which is rather unfortunate. So, in some ways, it seems yes, but in some ways, I don't know. It's I think two steps forward and three steps back. No. Just very briefly, um, I think all of us here are thinking or defining politics as being in Parliament, as being in the upper or lower house, or being an MP. <coughs> politics actually is organizing people in order to achieve a particular end. It goes on all the time, in all walks of life, everywhere. There's office politics, there's the sort of, you know, around the world, the, the water, water tank politics, there's politics at the local level. You know, many, 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 many years ago, long before most of you were born, there was community development in the 1950s, and everyone thought it was a wonderful idea because it was sort of apolitical and it was, you know, something that non-governmental organizations could do and they wouldn't be interfering in countries. Actually, it was the most political thing you could do because it was getting people organized at the local level to make demands on the local, regional, and even the central resources. That's politics. So I think that, in a way, what we need perhaps to do is to think more broadly about what politics is and to encourage, you know, uh, women and girls, and, and particularly our children, in many, many areas to think in terms of organizing people for particular reasons. I mean, one of my grandsons, uh, my youngest grandson, um, has had a petition the other day. He wanted to be able to wear one earring in his ear at school, which doesn't allow it, and this team was absolutely important. And he got 134 signatures. When I get back, I shall find out the outcome of it. But that's politics. My name is Iki Mistra. In India, hereditary politics has become the norm because I think our politicians consider themselves royalty. And it now becomes that a, a, a son or a nephew must ascend the throne. 
And I would like to quote the Queen of Denmark. She had said, Denmark is a monarchy where democracy prevails. India is a democracy where monarchy prevails. Good <laughs> uh, evening. That was a lovely presentation that we heard today. I have just one point, and it is India specific. I have been through most of the country, villages, remote areas, and most urban metro cities. In every home that I went, I saw the ladies wearing the pants. In every lady prime minister that I heard of, whether it will be Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher, Sri Mahabho Bandhanayake, it was the lady in the cabinet who wore the pants again. So I failed to find the reason why ladies are not coming into politics. Perhaps the basic reason is, and if you go to the villages, it's the lady who is working in the fields at home. She is the earning, earning member, not the man. In Nagaland, if you go, if you ask the Naga man, what are you doing? He said, listen, I was born to drink and fight. That's all. <laughs> Nothing else, that will not work. So, I think it is somewhere where our system has failed, and that is educating the girl child. If we educate the girl child right from the beginning, these things will come to it. Okay, I think uh, Baroness D'Souza has, by redefining politics, brought us very much down back to earth. Um, and in that context, perhaps with the title uh, that we are working with this evening, we should remember that feminists had a very uh, nice slogan in the 1980s. They said, the personal is political which means that politics is also about every personal relationships. It, it's about what you do in your home, in, in family. So all of that is also political. And that, of course, is crucial to looking at anything about gender. And indeed, many of the interventions from the floor have been about that. Do we kill our girl ch children? Is there infanticide? Is there feticide? Should we educate the girl children? All these are not about institutional politics as much as they are about the politics that happens within families and communities. Now, it is always very nice to say we should. We should educate our girl children. We should stop killing our own daughters. Who is this we? <coughs> who is this we? Who is the we who will stop doing it? And really, when we talk about institutional politics, I think this we is what you have to stand up and talk about. In that context, I think in a country like India, the merit argument is, it just doesn't work. I mean, in what context can we say that India, a country like India, doesn't have enough women with merit to go into politics or into anything else? Um, or there aren't the right kind of women for politics? I, to me, that kind of argument makes absolutely no sense at all. And the men who lay on the floor of the Rajya Sabha do not let that bill be passed are the men who will not let women or who are with merit or without merit or anything whatsoever to enter those hallowed halls. There is opposition. You, you cannot treat this question as though it's a neutral question, as though, you know, there are people out there with merit or without merit who will strive and get, as though this is an equal playing field. It is not an equal playing field. And unless we accept that, we, oh, there, this, the, the striving for gender equality will always remain a continuous work. It will always remain striving and never reach um, any goal. I will say a last thing about the question, the connections between family, community, and institutional politics, which takes the shape in the Indian context, which many of you have spoken about and Moha has spoken about, of hereditary forms of political participation. Let us remember for a moment that India is a country of caste, Caste is a category of hereditary occupation. In our country, politics is not the only thing that is hereditary. 
Film acting is also hereditary. <laughs> Lawyering is hereditary. Doctors are hereditary. Every form of uh, occupation in this country, it is a custom, a traditional way of ordering things where everything follows hereditary lines. And that is where even when you eliminate caste, caste remains with you. Because the occupational part of caste, the hereditary occupation that is that unanchors caste is part of the organi organizing principle of Indian society. And unless we can break these uh, vicious links, connections, social connections between things like caste and gender, between a hereditary occupation um, and the position of women in society, we will not have gender equality. And in that kind of a hierarchical, hierarchical and unequal society, the merit argument is the first one we need to throw in the rubbish bin. Thank you very much. Shamita, sure, that was beautifully summed up. Really was, and uh, I'm sure you'll agree that, that this was a fascinating discussion. It's so many thoughts and ideas just resonated. Uh, so, uh, Baroness D'Souza, we were honored to have you with us this evening. Uh, thank you for taking our time to address this uh, session. Momoa, your candor and your keen insights, thank you so much. Um, Scott, it's always wonderful to work with you and your team, and thank you for hosting this evening. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. Have a very good evening.